Hey everyone, welcome back to the Overmatch Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin, and uh, it's great to have uh, Dr. Ushin McElvaney on the podcast again, um, calling from Ireland on Zoom call. Ushin, thank you so much for being on the podcast. We really appreciate it. I no bother. Uh, happy to be here, you know. Yeah, so Ushin's back in Ireland working as a doctor. Um, uh, Ushin, are you working in your specialty back there? Yeah, so I'm doing respiratory, you know, at the moment. Yeah. So that's respiratory infection, stuff like that. Is that the kind of stuff you deal with? Yeah, and also we, we would look into the uh, the ICU side of things. With um, dur- During the COVID thing, we saw a lot of people with um, a thing called ARDS, where you basically got your lungs getting chewed up, and we're looking into that. Um, we look at people with emphysema from smoking, uh, fibrosis in their lungs. Um, I imagine, uh, as in America, smoking-related um kind of uh, chronic problems are not as bad as they used to be because when we were growing up you know parents smoked in the car everybody smoked and then they yeah. banned smoking at pubs and, yeah. and I imagine it's not as bad as it was or, or am I wrong no it, it isn't as bad but like you know remember the lads the old lads in the pub whose whose hair was like dyed yellow with nicotine you know the, the, the tar staining and everything else you know but I mean not as bad yeah, so when I was working construction in New York, we were upstate New York one time, and we were at an old house where the, the father or the grandfather probably had died, and he sat in this particular chair all day long and smoked, just chain smoked. And after he died, you know, they were cleaning up the house and to, to sell it, and where he sat, the whole ceiling was yellow, and there was like two inches of tar on the ceiling, and they wanted us to paint it. And strip it first. So we had to get this industrial stride you know, detergent, spray it on with bug sprayers and scrub it. It was disgusting. I mean, that, yeah. that was what was inside his lungs. Yeah. Um, yeah. wonder he freaking died. When we were growing up, well, maybe not you, you're younger than me, but when I was growing up, smoking was the cool thing to do. And I never bought in. I never bought the peer pressure. I tried it once when I was a kid and I was like, this is disgusting. Why would anybody want to do this? But I'm glad to see it, it's not as bad as it was because it, it's a pretty disgusting habit. Yeah. Yeah. And Irish people have a genetic uh, predisposition to getting emphysema as well. Really? So, yeah. So we, Why would that we have be? a, so, so we have a thing called alpha one antitrypsin deficiency. One in 25 people in Ireland are a carrier for it. Um, and it's also very common in the Scandinavian uh, population, like the Swedish. Uh, and really? Is uh, it so, the climate? Um, well, you know, it, Honestly, it, it, it's just a, I, I think it's primarily because it's an island nation, a lot of intermarriage, and uh, some some carrier mutations may have benefits. Uh, but when you get a full, full thing, uh, it's it's quite bad for you. It tends to result in people getting emphysema at an early stage, even if they don't smoke in, in their forties or fifties. Really, can you be uh, tested for it at a young age? Yeah, yeah, you can be tested for it. Um, we have a very good registry here looking at uh, everybody who has uh, a particular mutation of alpha-1. Yeah, it'd be really good to ch- check yeah. kids early on in their life. And if they have it, say, hey, check it out, bro. You really shouldn't 100%. smoke. Not going to do also, well for it, you. it affects your liver, too. So it, it gives you cirrhosis as well of your liver. Even if you don't so you drink. can't smoke so, or drink. Basically, no crack at all. <laughs> Is there a lot of asthma in Ireland? You know, uh, the, the, the weather is kind of damp, you know, so, you know, uh, it's very funny. You know, I've talked to a couple of people who grew up in Ireland who had terrible asthma, but moved out to places like the United States. And suddenly those symptoms. That was my brother. My brother had terrible asthma his whole life. Uh, came out to the States when I was working in New York, worked with us for a year or two, never had an asthma attack. Went back to Ireland, yeah. boom, yeah. asthma came back. That's why yeah. I asked. It, it, to be honest, I say we're probably no different with asthma compared to other nations. It's just the climate, you know? Yeah, it exasperates yeah. it, right? Okay, cool. Yeah. We, we were just chatting before we hit the record button. Um, you were telling me you're going to start doing a little long-range shooting over there, right? Uh, listen, I mean, like, um, I'm already planning out drills to do out there, so it's good. Yeah, it's, it's a really addictive thing, especially when you're shooting steel and getting that instant feedback. It's Friday now. On Sunday, I drive to Little Rock, Arkansas to train the National Guard Sniper School instructors for a week. 14-hour um, drive. But hey, what can you do? I've got a long gun course here at the end of the month, in uh, the end of August in North Carolina. Then all of September, I will be in Camp Lejeune training the Marine Corps Special Operations course. Um, early October, I got a couple of SWAT teams lined up. 
Then uh, end of October, start of November, I'll be out in Utah training with the Marine Corps again. <laughs> busy, 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 man. Retirement's not what I thought it was going to be, but that's a good thing. Um, all right, what are we going to talk about today? So today we're going to talk about the case of Joe Brady's missing skull and the Invincible Society. All right, a lot of information there. It sounds like something Sherlock Holmes would come up with, uh, missing skulls and invincibles. So I remember you mentioned it before, but walk us through step by step, and I assume people don't know anything because I don't know anything, but uh, go ahead. Yeah, so I suppose best thing I can... I, I, we, we, did, we touched on this uh, before when we were talking about the Fenian Brotherhood. So uh, in our previous podcast, we said the Fenian Brotherhood was a, a secret oath-bound organization um, dedicated to liberating Ireland by force of arms against the British. And that really came out of the consequences of the Irish famine. Ba- basically, when, when almost a quarter of your population's uh, wiped out and another quarter leave to uh, go to the United States, there's going to be some sort of groundswell of, um, well, the desire for revenge and retribution. Yeah, and you might think, that, you know, the potato famine is an act of God. There's nothing they could do, but it was the way they handled it. And a lot of people think it was actually genocide, right? Um, they told, at one point, they told the Irish people they could just boil the potatoes with the potato blight in them and it'd be fine. They did it and it was killing them in big numbers. Um, they shipped all the grain and all the other foodstuffs to England to feed the English because there was a uh, potato blight all over uh, Europe. But it was the way they handled it, right? But uh, in, in fairness, I think the... The, the people who came to found the Fenian Brotherhood uh, viewed it very much like a genocide in the sense it was an opportunistic genocide. They saw the opportunity to clear the land. Uh, and British officials were on record saying, we want to see an Irish man as rare on the bank of the Shannon as an Indian is as rare on the bank of the Hudson. So they wanted to work this out, essentially. Most of the Native American population in the United States were killed by disease, right? European uh, disease. And some of it was just true traders and stuff like that. But la- later on, they were given blankets with, with influenza on them, and, and it was purposeful. And it killed them in massive numbers. Most of the Native American population in America died from disease. They didn't die from gunshots or battle. Um, but kind of the same thing. It was the, the negligence in dealing with the famine in Ireland, and it was purposeful negligence right yes yeah horrible yeah and you know uh the fenian brotherhood kind of came out of that it's kind of i I wouldn't make too many similarities but you can see it with like for example the jewish population when they got out of the holocaust that whole sense of never again you know so basically the fenians were founded to ensure that never happened again and the best way they saw that was to remove uh the british establishment that was developing within ireland now, um, people like Jeremiah Donovan Rossa, uh, John Devoy, and other notable fiends like James Stevens were physical force Republicans. And basically, they, they, they didn't believe in political negotiations. And, and throughout Irish history, uh, basically, the, 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 uh, Irish, the Irish liberation movement has gone between uh, political uh, versus physical force, whatever works best. At this point, it was it was physical force because we'd just been decimated, you know. So there was no political influence back then, right? Because the Irish really didn't have political influence. Um, there was always a struggle within that Republican movement between the ballot box and the Armalite, right? It was always you try one, you try the other, yeah, and then you get to a point where you you work both of them simultaneously all the way up until the peace treaty. I remember hearing a story of a famous Republican. And I think he was in South Armagh, and he said, "We will bomb them to the negotiating table, and then we'll booby trap the table." <laughs> what what uh, year? What time frame are we talking about right now? So, any time after eighteen forty five, sort of the 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 uh, the, found, uh, the founding of the Fenian Brotherhood was starting to take place. You know, um, after the famine. Yeah. Um, now. They were very successful in, in many respects. And as you said yourself, uh, a lot of the stuff they did was kind of emulated later on by other Republican groups, such as the Provisional IRA. Their targets were predominantly military, commercial, political. Um, so they had a bombing campaign, a skirmishing fund that was set up uh, where they would get hardened members, usually Civil War veterans from the American Civil War who had 
good experience with combat. Uh, they're uh, also good experience with IEDs because they're dealing with the Confederate Army. Uh, retrofitting. I- yeah, if they fought for the Confederacy, they were dealing with guerrilla warfare because that was a lot of what the Confederacy did. And they didn't call it that, but it was hit and run tactics, right? Those cavalry units, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, John Bell Hood, a lot of those hit and run tactics. And like you said, booby trapping stuff and, and uh, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of those young men, probably as teenagers, uh, left around the time of the famine, went to the United States, um, settled, and then fought in the Civil War on both sides. Uh, became very comfortable with combat, became very comfortable with weapons and killing, and then um, came back to Ireland. The British drove them out, went to the United States, learned all these skills, and came back to fight the British. It's a circle of life. Yeah, and, you know, uh, they were quite successful. Now, obviously... Uh, Political violence without a political voice sometimes, you know, it, it has its own problems. Um, and basically, around this time, uh, there was an issue uh, with regards tenant farmers being pushed off their land. Uh, a, a thing that developed was called the land war. Basically, um, British tenant, uh, British landlords were kicking off Irish tenant farmers, and they needed a political voice. Now, at this point, the Irish Parliamentary Party, which were an Irish nationalist party who wanted to, um, I suppose, get it a degree of freedom for Ireland via political means alone uh, came to the fore. And it wasn't uh, like they were pushing for the bridge to get out. They were looking for a power sharing thing, right? Exactly. Well, they, they would try and bring on more ardent nationalists uh, to their cause by saying, no, we're for Irish freedom. But in reality, all they would have really re- would have achieved was a, a very, very... Uh, watered down version of democracy to Ireland. Yeah, this is at the height of the British Empire, right? It was after World War One and particularly World War Two, where the British Empire kind of fell apart. Mm. But around about this time, they should have been at their height. Would, would that be right? Oh, 100 percent. I mean, the, you know, the the the, um, the British used to famously say uh, the sun never sets in the on the British Empire because they controlled most of the world. Now the Irish would say the sun never sets in the British Empire because you couldn't trust those bastards in the dark, but. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, so um, basically the Fenians realized that they needed uh, access to this political voice. So they, reading between the lines, there was sort of a, a, a deal done uh, behind the scenes between the Parliamentary Party and the Fenian Brotherhood. Now, there are Fenians who are on record who would never, ever accept any notion of going political like for example one of the founding members uh, jeremiah dunrossa famously said uh, it is in english parliament the chains for ireland are forged and any irish patriot who goes into that forge to free ireland will soon find himself welded into the agency of his country's subjection to england now that being said it just it just seemed that the opportunity to further their goals uh, with the political route as well, just was too good for some of the members of the Fiends. So they kind of agreed uh, to um, Charles Stuart Parnell to to quieten down their um, their activities. So no more bombings in London, uh, no more open rebellions. It'd be very very quiet. And Charles Stuart Parnell also used this to to his advantage because at any time uh, there was issues with the guards getting. Uh, laws passed to basically allow Irish people to have a little bit of control over their own country, he would famously say, you either deal with me or Captain Moonlight. And Captain Moonlight was this sort of uh, catch-all term for Irish agrarian violence, you know, uh, which was essentially the Fenian Brotherhood. Now, even though that the uh, the Fenians went away uh, from, a, from, I suppose, the... Uh, open view at least, they kept open an organization known as the Irish National Invincibles. Now, it's been uh, up for debate whether or not it was a separate organization or it was like a splinter cell um, being kept alive by the Fenian Brotherhood. I'm of the belief that it was very much part of the Fenian Brotherhood's uh, apparatus as a covert political assassination unit. So... Just to give you an example, a, um, uh, the chief secretary 
the British uh, British government's chief secretary in Ireland, William E. Foster, basically uh, arrested uh, Charles Stuart Parnell and a lot of the constitutionalist nationalist leaders. Basically, a um, they were doing too well politically, so he arrested them. Uh, now, to answer that, uh, the Invincibles basically attempted to, to assassinate him. So you can see there is a, a a cause and response here. They're definitely linked, you know. So so it's almost like, uh, again, almost very similar to the Divisional IRA with their TUIS strategy later on, tactical use of armed struggle. So anytime something's not going right politically, well, a bomb might just go off or someone important might get assassinated, you know. Yeah. Was Parnell elected or was he just like self-appointed? No, he was elected. So he did something that would be uh, totally against uh, uh, Union Brotherhood and Republican ideology, which is to go into British Parliament. So he took took a seat in Westminster. Yeah, the early version of Sinn Féin, huh? Essentially, yeah. So, I mean, like, uh, th- that is a... I suppose Sinn Féin still haven't taken their seats in Westminster, but the idea of being sort of a, a constitutionalist party, uh, certainly. And a... Um, but at the same time, having that, uh, having that sort of, uh, how can you put it, a whiff of cordite about you, you know? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. So um, basically, the, uh, the the Invincibles were a secret organization. No one really knew their name uh, up until the point of their most famous assassination. So in nineteen, sorry, in eighteen eighty two, uh, the Fenian brother assassinated Lord Cavendish and Thomas Burke, the two most important British officials in Ireland. So this made international news. Um, Lord Cavendish and Thomas Burke were walking through the polo grounds in the, uh, the Phoenix Park. And I, I'm sure you remember the Phoenix Park itself. I do. Be- beautiful grounds, uh, you know, not open to the average public, you know. So these uh, these assassins got over the wall, snuck in, and because they were worried about being searched, uh, the weapons they used were e- easily concealable surgical knives. So like scalpels. Um, they killed uh, Cavendish's uh, entourage, his bodyguards, uh, and proceeded to finish off Cavendish and Burke. Um, now, do we know how many assassins there were? Because the bodyguards were obviously armed. They were. And if they had knives, know, that, that, you know how many attackers there were? There was a couple of them there, yeah. It's a good question. I mean, like, all we know is the ones that were arrested and the ones that were executed. And the ones that were executed, not all of them were actually involved either. Um, so the, the person who is seen to very much like the Fenian brother, the Invincibles had a cellular structure. Mm-hmm. A, um, sorry, had a cellular structure. So Joe Brady was the center of that circle. Uh, and around him, uh, he was the A of the circle. Around him were the Bs, the Cs, and the Ds. But Joseph Brady was basically the, the commanding officer of that unit. Um, who else was involved? Well, for sure, Daniel uh, Curley was probably involved. Uh, James Fitzharris, another gentleman, was probably involved. But others that were arrested, it, it, it's really up for debate. Uh, a young gentleman. You know how many were arrested? Oh, so uh, let me see. There's quite a number that were, that were arrested. Um in the initial round of there's quite a few. The problem is, is that one of the people who was definitely involved in it, uh, under harassment and torture while he's in prison, turned on, on the others, and uh, and he flipped basically. He he fingered several members. Um, so I'd say Joseph Brady most certainly was was a um, in uh, involved. Daniel Curley, another gentleman, Michael Fagan, Thomas Caffrey, Timothy Kelly, um probably all involved in some way, shape, or form. Um, now, the person who, who uh, sold them out was a guy called Kerry. Um, he's been vilified in, in many uh, books. However, uh, probably the best book on the Fenian Brotherhood is uh, this one right here. It's called The Invincibles. It's written by a good friend of mine who passed away, uh, Shane Kenna. Uh, basically, it was his life work. Uh, writing about the uh, Fenian Brotherhood and, and associated groups. And um, he kind of paints him as more of a tragic figure. Um, the chief investigator, a gentleman called Malin from Armagh, 
hunted these guys down. And once he had turned Kerry, um, after basically just harassing, abusing, and uh, essentially torturing these people, a, uh, he basically got him to uh, implicate several key members of that particular unit. Uh, Kerry was, I'll, I'll get on to him in a little bit, but uh, essentially he sealed the fate for, for many of the main operators in that particular unit. However, the, the, the founding members of the Invincibles and all the other circles, due to the cellular nature of it, were never actually caught. So they existed after this, uh, uh, the executions. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not defending the guy, but um, God knows what was used against him, like family or, yeah. you know, all these tricks and all that. And then he was, he was no. horribly tortured. Um, but it, it's all lost to history on, on how they managed to flip him. Uh, again, I'm not defending him, but we, don't, we just don't know. I mean, like, um, I think that a, uh, his religion was used uh, greatly against him. Malin caught him when he was coming out of the chapel and, uh, you know, basically used a, uh, the religious element, you know, uh, basically the, the, the moral implications, et cetera, of him lying to him, of murder, et cetera. Uh, but uh, yeah, the thing is, if you're in a cell structure like that, if somebody gets rolled up, you have to have a mechanism in place to scatter. And uh, maybe they didn't do that. So, so, so the, the the main people probably in that organization were never touched by this. Um, but that unit was was compromised. Um, now, just to give you an idea though of of what kind of people the Invincibles were by and large. They 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 test uh, they made a um, uh, made them testify in court. And bear in mind, th these guys are being told, "Oh, you're going to be hanged by the neck until you're dead. That's what's going to happen to you." Um, Daniel Curley, one of the members who is most certainly a member of the Invincibles, and probably was uh, certainly implicated anyway in this in this assassination. Um, his speech from the dock uh, reads as such. He says, I don't seek redress. Of course, mm -hmm. I expect no mercy. I don't pray for pardon. I expect none for the British government. They are my avowed enemies. I know the position in which I am standing here. I am standing on the brink of the grave. I will speak the truth. I admit I was sworn into the Fenian organization 12 years ago when I was only 22 years of age. And from that time until the present, I worked openly in the organization. I was led into a number of their secrets. And I will say here today, I will bring them to my grave faithfully and truly as to my own life. If I had a thousand lives to lose, I would rather lose them sooner than bring to my grave the name of the informer and that I should save my life by betraying my fellow man. I am a member of the Invincible Society, undoubtedly, unhesitatingly. So... He took that on the chin, essentially. I mean, like, uh, Kerry, unfortunately, was, uh, at that point, at that time at least, was weak and they um, compromised. Now, t the sad part of Kerry is that, you know, Malin gave him a few bucks, sent him off to uh, South Africa, where he'd be set up with a new identity, new life, uh, in their form of witness protection back in, in those days. Of course, when he was on the st uh, steamboat to South Africa, a gentleman named Patrick O'Donnell came up to him, pulled out a revolver and shot him. Twice in the chest, one in the head. And uh, Patrick O'Donnell basically got revenge for the other. And this kind of, again, played into the whole psyche that the British government had the, had the time. The You know, even if you look at British literature, you look at the uh, works of uh, Conan and Arthur Doyle with Sherlock Holmes, a... Um, it's a mysterious Irishman pulling strings from the shadows. He's attacking everywhere. It's a global conspiracy. That was a Fenian brother at the time. Yeah, was, was that Moriarty or whatever that name was? Yeah, Moriarty, an Irish name, you know. His second name was Moore, you know. Yeah, once they probably got the intelligence from that guy, they probably washed their hands of him. They probably drove him from Dublin Castle uh, in a police car or whatever, unmarked car, straight to the ferry and put him on the <laughs> boat, not really caring if he got killed. Um, because they probably could have protected him if they wanted to. He was a spent asset, like, you know, I mean... Um, I imagine the intelligence that the, the Invincibles had was pretty good. It's funny when you look at it and you go through, like, the, eight, or the late 1800s and into the 1900s and, you know, the, the 1916 rise and Collins and all that. It seemed like the IRB and the IRA had really good intelligence. And then later on in the conflict, um, near, you know, in the 80s and 90s, it seemed like British intelligence had really heavily infiltrated the IRA, and we're doing a lot of damage um, to them. Uh, would, that, would that be right? 
Well, it's very interesting. I mean, like, at some points you have to sort of wonder about that as well because you look at you look at questions. Uh, I suppose it would be delving a lot into the history of it, but if you look at questions like steak knife, which was a um, Scapatici, uh, and he was involved in internal security, uh, but there's there's something that doesn't quite settle quite right with that particular story, and. In my opinion, I could be wrong. Like I, I wouldn't. I'm not in the know. But if the British intelligence had totally infiltrated them, I don't think they would have allowed Canary Wharf or the Dockland bombings to happen, because it, it hit them where it hurts. It's money. Oh yeah, the financial district in London, right? Oh yeah. I mean, it's all about having your 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 uh, your human intelligence on a loose leash. But that's a very loose leash if you're willing to lose a billion. You know. Yeah, yeah, interesting. All right, let's let's go back to the eighteen hundreds. So, um, and it, one thing that is interesting though is that I would view Collins as probably um, uh, part of the same apparatus as Athenians, the Invincibles. It's all just one organization essentially. Um, now, uh, essentially, uh, unfortunately for these people who were who were basically fingered by um, Kerry. They were executed. They're all hanged to death. And some of them, now, uh, I would be, I put money on uh, Michael Fagan not being actually a member of the Invincibles. I think he may have been a Fenian. He may have been involved in that milieu of Irish political strife, but I don't think he was a member of the Invincibles, and I don't think he was there on the day of the assassination of Lord Cavendish and Thomas Burke. But he was hanged nonetheless. Um, Now, the one thing that strikes us as particularly strange is basically to send a message to the Irish people as a whole um, and also showing just general disregard for, I think, the, the Irish Irish as a race. Tom uh, Joseph Brady, when he was hanged, after which they chopped off his head and they sent it to the College of Surgeons where I went to college for phrenology studies. Now, phrenology is a study of skulls to, to differentiate races. Uh, it, it, it's basically no longer seen as a, it's a pseudoscience nowadays, but back then they took it very seriously. And they would have um, pictures where they would have the uh, Anglo-Teutonic uh, skull, pristine. And then they would have what they would call uh, the Negroid skull. Bad. And then you would have the Irish Hibern- hibernio Celt skull, also bad, you know? And they would uh, you'd see it, very commonly in um, certain periodicals like Punch, where they would draw the Irish kind of simian like apes, you know. So they basically had this notion that we were genetically and ethnically inferior. Uh, so they sent off his skull to be studied by the College of Surgeons because naturally anybody who would want to overthrow the British in Ireland had to be mentally insane and had some genetic abnormality, you know. So, so. Uh, Basically, they sent off a skull to the college, and colleges never returned it. So his his body, his body, and the bodies of those other men who, you know, essentially were were trying to to liberate us, uh, are in a lime pit grave in Kamenum, and his skull is in the College of Surgeons in a dusty room. Have you seen it? There's about twenty or thirty skulls in a room. They're not tagged, but there is a movement at the moment. Uh, by uh, the National Committee of the uh, National Graves Association. And Shane Kenna, my, my friend, was very much involved in this as well, uh, as as well as his friend, Aidan Lambert, in trying to recover the skull. Now, we have the uh, relatives of Joseph Brady, so we already have DNA. So the, the big thing for us would be to actually get into that room, get the skull and sample it. Uh, now, there's a precedence for this. Now, there's two precedents for this. Um, most recently, um, the British, well, Trinity College in Ireland uh, was very much a, a, a British establishment at the time. You know, uh, Irish candidates didn't go to Trinity College. You know, it was for for, for, for the Anglo-Irish, for, for the, um, the, 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 the Protestant ascendancy there. And um, they want to do more studies in phrenology. So they went to an island off the coast of Ireland, Inishbofin, and at a time where... Uh, the consecration of a grave and having a Christian burial was a very important thing to the Irish. Uh, They decided, you know, we're just going to take, we're just going to go into a graveyard still being used and we're just going to take some bodies. 
So they took a, a handful of uh, skulls with them. And only just this year did Trinity College give back those skulls to the families. Really? Why were they reluctant to give them back? You know, I, I think it's it, there's a bit of guilt there, you know, that they, they, they managed to mistreat people so badly. Also, colleges are, I think most colleges are an institution, they, they don't, they'll never admit blame uh, or uh, poor deeds in the past, you know. So uh, I, I think that's a real stumbling block there. Uh, I, I think... Is the effort to uh, take the skull and the body and reunite them, is, is that yeah, what so they're trying to do? Well, I, I think the first thing we could do is... Um, so there is, we have a good idea where the actual bodies are in Kilmainham. And if there's a bunch of bodies there, one missing a head, we definitely know we're in the right spot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mystery solved. <laughs> Mystery solved there, you know. The, the, the other thing is a um, this this isn't the first time this happened with someone who was involved in sort of Irish revolutionary actions. So uh, Kevin Barry' uh, body was only basically gotten out of Kilmainham in two thousand and one. Uh, so uh, Kevin Barry, and I, can you go to Kilmainham now and, and visit it? Oh, yeah. There's some really yeah, cool can. historical places in Ireland. I think when you get away from it, you appreciate it more. You know what I love to do, but I can't afford it. I'd love to go back to Ireland oh, and me and you go around and some some of your, your buddies and stuff that are very, very knowledgeable, go around all the historic sites and make YouTube videos on them all. Yeah. It would be awesome. How cool would that be? I, man, I wish I'd stayed in school and maybe I'd have some money right now and t- instead of a bunch of worthless skills that I have. All these military skills that I have that are absolutely worthless now. Military freefall. Never going to use it again. Um, breaching. Explosive Ballistic and mechanical breaching, right? Um, French, big French. Um, I, I have dozens of skills that are absolutely freaking worthless to me now. But imagine if we could make YouTube videos on all the historic stuff in Ireland for like two millennia. How badass would that be? Oh. You know, it'd be a cool podcast as well. It would be um, a podcast about kind of the history of medicine and all the crazy stuff they did throughout the, the years, right? Leeches and all that, eugenics, the study of eugenics and all that stuff. And it wasn't that long ago some of this crazy stuff w- w- was going on, right? Mainstream as well, you know? Everyone believed it. So, um, back, have the families been active in trying to get this skull returned? They have, and actually, to be honest, a lot of politicians have as well. I, I think, to be honest you, though, um, look, essentially... There's a certain, even if you, removing the politics from it, there's something that's just grossly immoral, knowing that you have a person's skull just languishing in someone's storeroom when you know they, they can be repatriated with the rest of their body and giving them a proper funeral, you know? Yeah, it, it's a very medieval thing, chopping somebody's head off. Yeah, but it, it, was, it was also basically at the time, you know how religious and also to a certain extent superstitious people were. They felt if you weren't get, weren't whole when going into the ground on resurrection, you wouldn't be whole either so it was a psychological warfare kind of thing as well yeah yeah was that done a lot or was that a very isolated incident uh, in in that particular case it was based to mark mark their cards because it, the magnitude of killing those two people was immense like i mean this is when britain ruled most of the world and to think so close to home two of their main guys in, in, in their political establishment were just murdered in broad daylight stabbed to death Along with their body, guards. yeah, yeah, it, it's pretty embarrassing. Really. It is, and, and from people again, they viewed as subhuman, judging by their skull shape. You know, yeah, when subhuman people so, are kicking your ass, it, it's a little embarrassing. It is, it is. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, so like, I mean, this also happened with uh, there. There was a big delay in getting out um, Kevin Barry's body as well from Kilmainham, and, and Kevin Barry. Uh, I know we're fast forwarding and jumping, but uh, after the whole rising in 1916 and the, the War of Independence, uh, Kevin Barry, who's a medical student, uh, basically joined the fight. He was 18. Uh, he was a member of the, the IRA in Dublin, and uh, he was caught during an ambush. And uh, he was sentenced to being hanged to death. Uh, they refused to give him a soldier's death. He wanted to be shot. They said, no, we're hanging you. Uh, they interrogated him and tortured him. Now, they severely tortured this young fella. But Kevin Barry, despite being only 18, did not give up anybody. 
I mean, they dislocated his shoulders from both joints. Uh, they yeah, the they level. probably hung him up, uh, probably hands behind the back yeah. and strung him up from the ceiling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, most of his fingers were broken. Um, and, uh, you know, he they, they said, if you confess, if you give up your comrades, we'll let you go. And he decided mm -hmm. against that, you know. So, yeah, so uh, essentially he was hanged put in a, a quick lime grave as the these invincibles were and up until 2001 uh we could we couldn't actually get him out yeah you would think that once ireland gained its independence the republic of ireland got its independence all that stuff would have happened pretty quickly sure. Sure. but i i guess the other things on their mind civil war being one i i, I think there's an element of that you know because they um even though that the uh the actual physical war had ended particularly at least in the 26 counties in the south uh, there was still an economic war going on between Ireland and England. Uh, there was a there was a real concentrated effort by the British at that time to ensure that Ireland floundered as a nation and that they would come right back in. Oh yeah, yeah, no, that makes but, sense. But at the um, time, wasn't there an orphanage out west later? This is off topic, but it just sprung into my head. Wasn't there an orphanage out west where a, a bunch of kids? born out of wedlock oh, and they yeah. found all the bodies in the backyard or something like that in in, in yeah. under something like that in tomb i think it was um and uh, it was like a, a mother's and, and baby's home uh, yeah they weren't given um they weren't given a proper burial at all you know which is very very poor yeah that thing where um a woman got pregnant and and went to England and had the baby and then you know came back and then you know the the grandmother you know raised the child as her own mm. that that went on for a very long time up in, into the seventies yeah. probably um, very very it's late. very interesting you say that like when when um, De Valera was De Valera was born out of wedlock by the way you know um, uh, one of the first presidents of Ireland and uh, um, it, it's kind of funny because it's something that's kind of glossed over but it was very much held against him uh, during a uh, during his time in politics. Yeah. So, I mean, like, bear in mind, Ireland, Ireland's a very strange place when you think about it, but, like, he was the son of, an, the illegitimate son of an Irish mother and a Cuban father um, from Galician descent. So his real name was De Valeros, and it was changed to De Valera, shortened to Dev, uh, came back to Ireland, and, you know, like essentially, you know, probably one of the more recognizable political figures in in, in Irish history. Um, but yeah, like I mean, that sort of stigma of being a, an illegitimate child was quite a bit. Probably because of our um, conversations here, I broke down the other day and I watched uh, <laughs> Michael Collins the movie, right? And and it, Liam Neeson's great in it, and he's a great actor. But they they they, they always have to Hollywoodize it, right? And and Julia Roberts is in it, which is absolutely freaking ridiculous. Uh, but they make De Valera out to look like a scumbag, like he like he screwed over Collins, and he was just a shady character. Was that true? No, I, I look things are things are more nuanced in real life. You know, I mean, like, like don't get me wrong, I, I don't think and I, I'm just going to be on the record for this. I think um, Mike Collins for that time period was the best military or intelligence leader Ireland could have. I think De Valera was probably the one of the most capable political leaders that you could have. But the problem with politicians is, you know, most people will feel, any soldier will generally feel at some point a politician may have screwed him over. And they may have felt that they're being, they're compromising on things they shouldn't compromise on. Now, I think De Valera, you know, and Collins, it's it's very hard to say. I mean, like, I think personally, I think uh, if Collins had survived, and that's a real big if, I genuinely think it would have been like the second Tet Offensive. I think he would have gotten the weapons. I think he would have gone into the north and he would have taken it by force. I think that's what would have happened. It just didn't happen like that, you know? It, it's funny you say that. Collins wasn't known, as far as I understand, to, to be... Uh, <laughs> a very capable fighter, but he's very, very good at intelligence. And in a war like that, and in most wars, intelligence wins. Intelligence wins the battlefield, right? You're being buzzed there, doctor, and there's probably somebody dying, and you're like, no, 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 I'm good. I'm on a podcast. <laughs> no, no, it's 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 grand, it's grand. Yeah. How long were you in America? Real quick. I was there for about a year. About a year. You had some weird stuff happen to you while you were in America. I can't talk about half that stuff, as you know. Yeah, there, there was things where uh, I remember talking to you about it, and you're like, 
Good luck getting security clearance. <laughs> Oh, she talking to you uh, about Irish history makes me really want to go back to Ireland. I, I've been looking into, and I've always been kind of fascinated by warrior cultures. Um, mm -hmm. The Comanche, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Celts were a warrior culture. The Spartans. Um, but, uh, you know, the Vikings I'm, I'm looking into now, and I, I've listened to podcasts and read some books, and, um, you know, Dublin was a, a Viking settlement, a big one, Waterford, Wexford. There was actually a Viking settlement in Anagassan, which is only like 20 miles from where I grew up. But um, I'd really, really love to go back to Ireland and, and, and go around all these historical sites uh, with someone like you or, or some of the people you know that, that knows all this stuff. I remember going to the Coliseum. I've been to the Coliseum a couple of times when I was stationed in Germany. And, you know, you walk around and it's really cool and you look at stuff and you already know what you're looking at. And then one time we took a tour. We actually paid and took a tour. And it was absolutely fascinating what all the stuff we missed. Um, so to have that local knowledge and, and to see what you're actually looking at is... Um, it's really cool that the the warrior culture thing. All, all these warrior cultures came about through necessity, right? Uh, I mean, it's horrible that they trained their kids to kill from a young age and all that. But all the cultures back then that were not warrior cultures were all wiped out by warrior cultures, right? So it came out of necessity. But you know, when I maybe I'll sell everything I have and come to Ireland and we'll do videos and YouTube and or, or when I win the lotto, I'll be there. Be, I looked at the cost and it would probably cost me yeah. about ten grand to realistically go over there and, and do that 10 grand that I don't have. But, you know, when I win the lotto, I'm coming. Yeah, you, you, you would. But tell you what, though, I'm sure there's someone who's probably watching right now, like some tours and boards somewhere. So I'm throwing it out there. Yep, send it. Send me a check and I'll go do documentaries with Ushin about Irish history. Um, if you can get the time off there, doctor. Absolutely. Yeah, are you working a lot now? Are you working a lot of hours now? You're pretty swamped? Yeah. More, more, well, it's just a lot of call, you know, a lot, lot of call. I, yeah. I assume you're living in Dublin, right? I, I is Yeah. It, it, it's, it's the uh, uh, most expensive city in Ireland, right? Oh. It's actually the most expensive place in Europe at the moment. Really? Wow. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm an American tourist coming to Ireland, uh, landing in Dublin, want to go see some historical sites. What do I do? You go down Grafton Street, you uh, uh, you go down Grafton Street, you take a turn off to Wicklow Street, you go to the International Bar, right, at 11 o'clock on a weekday or 1 p.m. on a Sunday, you meet up with a guy called Lorcan Collins. He said, said you know, Ushin mm -hmm. sent me. Um, basically, he'll take you on a great tour. You'll make friends. You'll have a few drinks. You'll have a great time. And, you know, you walk away with a, a good sense of Irish history. That's awesome. Is it a walking tour? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a walking tour. Yeah, because it's all fairly close, right? You probably go to, like, the GPO and, and the four courts. And, yeah. you know, you see all the damage from the 1916 rising, right? Yeah. And you get to see, um, you get to see uh, basically that whole sort of uh, Parnell Square area where we had our Alamo and Moore Street, essentially, our last stand. Uh, but I, 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 would, I would say, though... Um, with regards uh, tours, I mean, like, it's much better when you're walking, you know? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Absolutely. All right, your phone keeps going off there, doctor. Um, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much. I really appreciate okay. you coming on here. Um, let's do this again. Absolutely. Maybe we should do this once a month if you can find the time. I, do, yeah. I, I find it super educational and entertaining. And whether people watch it or not, but they do watch it. People like it. People are like, oh, Sheen's so cool. His accent's so much better than yours. <laughs> fake. <laughs> His accent's fake. He's an American accent. He's putting it on. Did you find yourself when you went back saying like things with an American accent or American words? Oh, Christ. Well, there's a couple of things that... There's a couple of things that Americans say. Uh, you just see plenty, of, you know. Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, give me one. No, no, no. I'm not going to embarrass myself here. All right, bro. Thank you so much. Uh, until the next time. Hey, uh, if you want to support the channel, uh, you can make a donation on the uh, iTunes or the uh, Spotify uh, thing. But it's also on YouTube as well. But uh, thanks everybody for your support. Until next time. Deadly, right? Mm -hmm. See you now. All the best. Bye. Bye.